This video is brought to you by Brazil Resources Incorporated. Trading on the TSXV is BRI and on the OTC is BRIZF. Brazil Resources is exploring for gold in the emerging gold districts of Brazil. The company is 35% institutionally owned with 16% of outstanding shares held by the KCR Fund, controlled by Doug Casey, Rick Rule, and Marin Catusa. The geological team has earlier discovered more than 10 million ounces of gold directly in Brazil and is led by successful mining CEO Amir Adnani. The company has 10 million in cash and no debt. For the thrill of gold discovery, visit brazilresources.com or call 855-630-1001. Now on the economic front, uh, do you see uh, another Lehman Brothers moment this year, uh, more QE? And also, do you see us remaining in this like sluggishness where we're not in depression, but we're certainly not in, in the 1990s and boom, boom years? Everybody just kind of, you know, you, you, people know a lot of people who are unemployed and uh, people are foreclosing and having trouble. How long are we going to remain in this sluggish economy? I mean, will eventually we either will we pivot either way or are we just going to, you know, be sluggish for years and years and years? No one knows. Uh, but I, you know, rub uh, elbows, so to speak, with uh, a lot of I consider very uh, well-studied and knowledgeable types. Uh, from my mastermind series recently, I just interviewed Dr. Uh, Petrov, or excuse me, uh, Krasmir Petrov, and he comes from Bulgaria, and he gives a great interview and a real-life thing. What I like about those type of interviews is that it's not hypothetical; it's real life. It's what really took place, and we know what happened. We have facts to deal with. And he said when he started in the army that a sandwich in Bulgaria was a dollar. And when he finished his graduate school and got his PhD, which I'm going to guess is like, I don't know, 12 years later, that same sandwich was $3,000. But it was a slow grind all the way through. It wasn't, you know, a one-day event, $1 to $3,000. Yeah. And that's what he has forecast for us. And I tend to agree with that. There's, it's a momentum thing. Now, not that it can't catch fire, not that the velocity of money can't turn very rapidly and all of a sudden from being no one spending any money to f the fear of inflation of the psychology changes is what it is because the money pool is there. It's just that it's not changing hands. It's called velocity of money. So once the psychology changes that I'd rather own a hammer or a Snickers bar or a, cart of, a carton of milk than this dollar bill, then the velocity will pick up rapidly and you could have a big inflation. I don't see hyperinflation in the U.S., but it depends how you define it. Regardless, that is not taking place. And I don't know where the trigger point is. I know the money pool is there. So as an Austrian economist, is inflation taking place? The answer is yes, because the money supply has been increased dramatically. But has it manifest? The answer is no, it has not. And of course, the biggest question is when, where, and why. And I don't know when, and I don't know where, but I know why. And why is psychology will change. Somewhere along the line, it doesn't have to be internal in the United States. It could be the velocity of money outside of the U.S., where the Chinese has had enough of our debt, or Japan, or whomever, and they start repatriating U.S. dollars through the bond market. And that's causing an acceleration in the psychology of inflation or an increase in velocity or both at the same time, most likely. And then all of a sudden that could catch very rapidly. People's mood will change very rapidly. And if it does, you can have conditions that will cause a 250 sell-off in the silver market or a 250 increase in the silver market. And that's probably not a great example, but in any market, you can have a rapid change, something that's loved. I mean, look at, uh, not to bring up too much of the past, but you look at uh, Jim Cramer on Bear Stearns. Yeah. I mean, he's on his show saying Bear Stearns is fine. Well, it wasn't fine. And look at how rapidly it went from that TV program to what was basically worthless. Yeah. So things can happen rapidly. Uh, now, moving more into, uh, I guess, a personal um, achievements and people who are in this economy, they're young. What advice do you have for somebody who's young who wants to be successful what do they need to be focusing on right now? Because they're, they're, people are going to college and there's a lot of people with college degrees that don't have jobs. I'd say two things. Passion, I'd actually say three things. Passion, purpose, and perseverance. I think you have to be passionate about whatever you choose to do in life. If you don't, then you're an also ran. And I'm not saying that you don't get a college degree and you go out and get the best job you can and do the best that you can, because that's a life's lesson in and of itself. But if you're lucky enough to know what your purpose is and you have passion with that, then you just have to persevere until it happens. In my own case, I've always wanted to do what I'm doing now, okay? It didn't happen really in a big way until I was into my 40s, right? 
but I had the passion and I had the purpose and then I had to persevere because the first year I was in this business it took me forever to get 100 subscribers and I sold that letter at $60 an issue. I mean $6,000 for an annual income isn't exactly like rock star material, I think you'd agree. Yeah. But I persevered and because of that and the passion and the purpose it's all come together you know later on it didn't take long I mean you know the first year but you know luckily I had the savings and the ability to press on now a young person might not have had the advantage that I had of being a little older and having savings to fall back on and be able to get through that year and you know come what may I'm just able to persevere but that's what it takes I think those three things are key you know if you could find your passion there's purpose behind it. Free market, I think, isn't really well understood. I don't talk on this, and you know, I'll give credit where credit is due. I mean, I think Lou Rockwell, who runs the Mises Institute, or Mises.org, is one of the best thinkers I've ever met, and a lot of guys on that side as well. I won't put myself in their league, but I will say that you won't have to understand your purpose and the free market. The free market is a paradox. The paradox of the free market, in a real sense, or the way I define it, is that I could be very self-serving, but paradoxically serving others at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's what you really want. If you're only serving yourself, like a pump and dumper in the stock markets, for example, mm -hmm. that's self-serving. That's really not serving anyone else. But if you are a miner that's creating wealth for people that invest with you, you are serving yourself because you have a stake in it, but so do all your shareholders. That's self-serving and serving others at the same time, and that's the real free market. Now, if you are self-serving only in a real free market, the market will discover that pretty quickly, and they will exit your, you know, your investment or whatever you're doing, or the movie you made, or the, the song you wrote, or the food you produced, or whatever. The free market will determine pretty quickly what's going on in reality. Yeah. You know? And that's the beauty of it. But there's nothing better than to be able, in my view, than to be able to produce something that the market likes and you get to win and they get to win. It's a win-win in a real free market. Now, now building businesses, that's absolutely obviously fun. And if you're doing your purpose, you, you thoroughly enjoy it. When did you, um, David, take that leap of, of being an entrepreneur 100% where you had no boss, you had no job, you had no security? You were you were just it was you it was it was make or break when did when did you cross that line and what caused you to take that step of faith? Well, it was really put on me. Uh, it was over twenty years ago, and I lost my mainstream job in the corporate world. Now, on the website, it says I've been following the silver market basically for the last forty years, and that's a true statement. So I want to be very clear on that. But as far as earning a living, I didn't earn it. You know, being an analyst in the precious metals at that time, even though I was doing it. You know, constantly. So when it happened, it was a, a layoff. I mean, I was lost my mainstream job. And when that happened, I had to suck it up and decide, you know, what do I really want to do? And I had the opportunity and I took it. Uh, but again, it wasn't easy in the beginning, but it persevered. And you know, here we are today. I mean, successful or not, success isn't always measured by money. And I think I should make that clear as well. Yeah. Success is basically for me. It's a self-satisfying feeling that you have that you're serving your purpose. You're serving yourself again and serving others at the same time. I mean, serving of others is probably the highest state for a human being in my view. Because if it's all about how much you can get, you're really not going to get much. But it's really about how much you can give. And the more you give, it seems paradoxical again, but the more you get. That, that's interesting. I've, I've heard a lot of people say that and I've actually been blessed enough to, to experience that myself about helping people. Um, when it comes to, to, to building businesses, as far as looking at the, the, like the mining companies or the natural resource sectors, do you, do you have a preference to um, at what stage you enter that level? Do you like only looking at like seniors or do you like looking at the juniors? I mean, at what stage do you, what, at what stage does a junior mining company get your attention? I look at more at cycles because I've been through it once already. So I have a bit of an advantage, it's called experience. And there's not much that can replace experience. So early in the cycle, you really want to focus more on explorers because they all have great stories and they get heavy promotions and you can pick stocks that are basically dogs and do quite well if you know what you're doing. Uh, some of the guys I won't name here, but they got in there and did it right, but exited too late. 
Because once that part of the cycle is over, and it has been for quite some time, you really don't want to put money in explorers. Not to say there aren't a few, and we actually have had a couple, but you want to be very careful. So that part of the cycle favors the explorers. The part of the cycle that we're in now favors the mid-tiers, and that's what I focused on starting in 2011. So for the last year and a half or so, we've been focused on mid-tier producers that have the ability to increase production, either through discovery more on their properties, or building bigger mills, or getting their through rate better, or doing you know better economic work uh, through various means. So that's where the heart of it is right now for the Morgan Report. Now, now in order for someone to actually see what you actually are buying, Mm -hmm. They can subscribe and, and go to a paid service. What would what kind of stocks would they find? I mean, a lot of people go to silver-investor.com. Are they only going to see silver stocks if they pay for that service? Or what no, kind of stocks you guys have? No, actually, one of the stocks made the most money in was a Mollet company, believe it or not. It was a long shot in our speculative portfolio. First of all, let me back up. There's really three portfolios, and most people can spread out through all of them. We have a top-tier cash-rich unhedged companies. Those are basically your older people that just want you know, sometimes dividend paying stalwarts that are mainstream big name companies that really aren't going to move a lot but are going to make you money in the long term. Mm -hmm. Those are basically buy and holds. And then the mid tier where we're focusing most of our attention on have got a lot of stability but not as stable as a top tier generally speaking, there's always exceptions, and have better growth profiles. And then under that is a speculative portfolio which is bet a little to win a lot. And please don't put too much money in these stocks, even if they come from me. You know, you've got to spread out. You've got to probably have five, minimum 10, preferably. I think there's eight on there now. And so you've got to know what you're doing. Now, the idea for us is that you have big money in big companies and small money in small companies. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they change. I mean, if you go back to like Western Silver, which was Western Copper when we recommended it, it was a spec stock, but as it started the growth profile, certainly you could add to the position as the company grew. So, you know, not to, I don't want to be wishy-washy here, but I've been in the industry a long time. There's certain points where you kind of know that you know, the discovery's been made, the money's there, they've got the financing, it's still undervalued to go ahead and add to the position. That's not always the case, but in some cases it is. One last question I'd like to ask you that could get us both creamed, okay. but I've got to ask it because I believe, I, I know what your answer is going to be because I've spoken and spent so much time with you and I believe so much in it and I, I think people need to do it. There is a, a small group of people, I guess, or on the internet and blogs where most precious metals are discussed that are simply going 100% of their entire life, their entire net worth in physical, in nothing but all silver. You don't have to tell me, if, if you want to share us what you think about that, you can, but what I'd like to just ask the question of, what do you think a good diversification of your portfolio is? Is it 100% sure. silver? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm glad you brought the question up. In fact, you're doing me a service because uh, there are people that, that have that and uh, first on free market. So that could be correct for some individuals. I would say it is not correct for most. First of all, there's other sectors I think are very important during this inflationary end game, and that is the metals and energy. I think both those. Food is important as well. Water investments are important. So there's certainly anything that's needed. You remember, you may not, but back when I started with Jim Paplava, which is one of the early breaks I got, and thank you, Mr. Paplava, but uh, I was right there pretty much at the top of the stock market. And I said, the major macro shift is taking place now. We're going to move from a society of buying things that we don't want, in other words, paper stocks, into things that we need. We're going into the commodity super cycle. And certainly that's taken place. And so it's about things you need, be it metals, be it food, be it water. So that's where you should, I think, be invested. As far as what's the right one, it, it's, that's an individual choice. But generally speaking, I'll answer it, that the bottom line investing community across the board, I mean, everybody that has investable money should have some physical metal. Now that's not the case, as we both know, we're here at the Money Show doing this interview, and this is more mainstream, and there's trading programs and options, and there's ETFs, and there's Fibonacci retracements, and I mean, I've just read just through half the, the booklet that comes when you register, and I'm thinking, geez, you know, so many convoluted stair steps in this this maze of investing when it's really pretty simple. Money doesn't change. I mean, it's called the money show, but 99.9% .9 don't even know what money is. They think money is that green stuff you put in your pocket. What they don't know is that 100% of the time through history up until now, that kind of money has failed. Yeah. 
But the only money that hasn't failed is real money. But you ask them what real money is, they'll show you their money clip full of green stuff. So there's a lot, but it's, again, I'm passionate about it and I probably got sidetracked, but um, no, diversify. Have some cash, have some good quality stocks. And I wanna leave with one thought because it's most important. People, when they buy a house, buy the best house they can afford. When they buy a car, they buy the best car they can afford. Usually when they go clothes shopping, they buy the best clothes that they can afford. And certainly when they go food shopping, they usually buy the best food they can afford. But when they go stock shopping, they look for the cheapest stock they can find. Now, why is that? You know, it's, it's an incongruous thought pattern. If you always buy the best of everything you can afford, you should do the same thing in the stock market. I would rather have one share of Franco Nevada that I know is going to got the best two of the best mining guys, or at least in some opinions, that's going to make me money slowly over time, compound at twenty percent, and I can sleep at night really well. Than to have a hundred shares of XYZ mining that's going to go from one cent to three cents because when it gets to three cents, I might not be lucky enough to get out of it. Yeah. So I'm being a little. I'm not being facetious at all. I'm being very straight up about it, but it bothers me that people will do so a, such a consistency in every aspect of our life, but when it comes to investing, they all logic goes out the window. It's very interesting that you just brought that point up because I've never thought of that. But even in, in, in I would say, me, it's, it's, it's a natural thought that you're looking for the, 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 the biggest potential gain. You're, you're willing to take more of a risk, yeah. uh, but it's almost the same thing. I, I, I was, it's, it's that, that something about investments in our brains just, I don't know, we have to overcome something. I was thinking about it the other day, you know, if you buy a car and it went 50% down or let's say 40% down or whatever, you'd be really excited to go pick up that car that you want it. Yeah. But here, silver's down and, and I, I, I'm getting countless of emails of people ready to throw in the towel. Yeah. Um, are you personally buying silver right now in the state? I am, yeah, I've been buying, uh, as I've told my members and non-members, because I do a lot of interviews like this, uh, you know, under 30 long-term, meaning two to three years, they can be very happy. Uh, but you don't have to throw it all in at 30. Uh, you can certainly stagger it in. I think the best method for most people is just to make a plan and stick to it. There's all kinds of commodity trading uh, methodologies. A lot of them actually work. The problem is that there's a human element and the human will outthink the methodology. It can be very simple, but then, well, I think it's going lower. They don't, in other words, follow their the process. And if you don't follow the process, then you're going to mess up the results. But a consistent buying program in both gold and silver for most people, I think, is the best thing to do to start the metals program. I have a lot of people that have come up to me at these seminars through all over the world and said, you know, thank you, you've helped me, or it's, you know, helped me think, or I've gotten into metals because of you. And it's not just me. I mean, it's the Jim Sinclair, it's the James Turks. I mean, there's tons of people out there that are doing the same thing that I'm doing. But uh, it's rewarding, and they never subscribe to the Morgan Report, and that doesn't bother me in the least because I'm here to teach probably more than anything else that I do. Now the automatic uh, silver, what's the best way to just do that? I mean, obviously you can go down to your local coin shop, say, you know, you don't want to have it all in your house. Right. So what's right. another automatic way well, they could do it? Well, full disclosure, I'm affiliated with a program that's a silver saver. And um, the best way to get there is to go to silver123.net, that's silver123.net. If you are in that uh, dollar cost averaging program, in other words, you sign through your checking account, it takes about five minutes, in fact, my secretary just signed up for it recently, and I'm mm -hmm. going to have her probably write a piece about how easy it was. Okay. And you could save, I think the minimum is 100 a month. Okay. And then once you are in the program, the beautiful thing is you're on a consistent basis. So when silver is lower, you're buying more silver or gold. And when gold's higher, you're buying less. You just put in the same dollar amount. Over time, as long as you're in a bull market, and I truly believe we are, you'll accumulate quite a bit of you know, capital gains over you know, a year, two years, three years, five years, however long we have left. I think we probably have you know, five years left in this market. Additional to that, if you're any kind of entrepreneur, which we talked about earlier, once you join, you get an affiliate code of your own. Mm -hmm. So depending on how motivated you are, you could use your own email list, you could use Google Ads, you could put flyers out, you could do a number of things to try and enhance your income by, you know, uh, putting out being an affiliate of a, a gold and silver savings program. So it's a pretty neat uh, system as far as I'm concerned. Certainly it's not the only thing I recommend. Uh, I do recommend you know bullion dealers 
that I know quite well, and I spread it out across the board. Most of them are pretty competitive, and certain people have certain needs that others don't. I mean, if I get a high net worth person, a lot of times there's really two questions. David, I trust you, who do you trust? And I want to store who do you trust? And it's those two questions, and of course, that client I would probably put into um, a certain place with a certain broker that would not fit someone that called me and asked me where they're going to get the best deal on 100 ounce bars for an example. Uh, when I buy my silver, I just buy whatever the best deal is. Do you have a specific, do you like Eagles, do you like Bullion? I like it all. You know, again, it's personal preference. I mean, what I said, and to be consistent, when I wrote the 10 rules of silver investing, I said get the most silver you can for a dollar spent. And I think that's still a good general rule. So you're usually getting more silver buying silver rounds or junk bags than you're getting by buying silver eagles. Nonetheless, if you don't want junk bags, you want eagles, buy eagles. But you know, as far as dollar invested, once the market goes very high, the premiums come off. So in other words, you're going to get more money back out. Your net investment will actually be higher buying silver rounds than it would be buying silver eagles. At least that was the case last time. I expect it to be the same this next time. doesn't mean you shouldn't buy eagles. Just be aware. If you're out to squeeze every nickel out of profit that you can, you're probably best buying rounds and bars if you really want that. Uh, in closing, silver dash or hyphen investors, the best dot com is the best place to uh, see your site, subscribe. Okay and do the paid membership. You also have a blog, a lot, a lot of people might not know about it. How often do you update your blog? Oh, constantly, basically, you know, one of my staff does that. I mean, I do every interview like this that I do, we try to get on the blog. Every radio show I do, we try to get on the blog. Then I do a question of the week that gets on the blog, and these come from either paid members, sometimes not. Uh, and it's, it's a good roundup. I mean, I don't expect people to have a, the amount of time to listen to everything I do, although I've had people tell me they do. <laughs> but usually you can get a pretty quick overview. I do a metals update for thestreet.com uh, every Friday. I do Butler on Business every other Friday. I do Jim Poplava's Financial Sense.com uh, about once a month. And then I get random interviews, probably two or three a week when the market's hot, and maybe one or two a week when the market's cold like it is now. So it's basically a place that you can just get on the free email list and if you want to review and we usually note what they are and you know you can listen for five minutes or not it's up to you but that's a, a good way I think to uh, keep in tune in the silver market I mean there's other writers in there Ed Steer a friend of mine writes for Doug Casey known Ed from the beginning in fact I think Ed was one of the few people sitting in the audience at the first show I ever spoke at which is the Cambridge House show mm -hmm. probably I don't know 12 13 years ago and didn't even have PowerPoints back then. We're still using vellums, and I was so wow. nervous that the plastic was shaking <laughs> when I was putting it down on the overhead projector. Can you believe it? I mean, that's how far back it goes. But Ed's been around a long time. Does a great letter on uh, on the silver and gold markets, particularly focusing on silver. A lot of people in the silver space are even more strong in their conviction, I'd say, than some of the gold bugs. Wow, that's interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Appreciate it.